Have you or a loved one recently thrown a game of Dota 2? If it didn't happen at the Roshan pit, it probably happened at the high ground. Guys, I see so many mistakes around here. Whether you're defense or offense, like, people just don't know how to approach this. Or maybe some do, but not everyone does. And, like, if one person is on the wrong page, then it can make the game really hard. So, we're going to cover some common mistakes. Uh, we'll, actually, we'll start with why the high ground is so hard to breach. Um, and once you understand why it's hard, that helps to formulate a plan on how to take advantage of that when you're defending, or how to you know, try to circumvent that if you're the one trying to break the high ground. We're going to cover all that because this really is its a key part of Dota. You have to know how to do this if you want to close out a game. And I personally have a rule where I never give up on a game, no matter how hopeless it feels, until I have lost at least one set of barracks. Because I know it is so common to throw on the high ground. So... After this, I hope you'll understand that too, and that you'll try to throw less games with some of this knowledge. Let's start with the defender's advantages, which are quite numerous. First, they have the high ground. So not only does that give a mischance to people who attack from the low ground up to the high ground, ranged heroes, you also have a vision advantage where you can just, you can see them, but they cannot see you unless one of their heroes or creeps make it to the high ground, or they try to place wards. But even wards, in fact, we'll, we'll go to the lobby real quick. Even wards will not necessarily fix this. So let's look down here. Look how far our tower can see in the daytime. We can see all the way out here. And if we were this juggernaut, and we can see that like if we're over here, like we're even all the way up here, and we still can't see anything here. That makes it a bit scary, where we don't know what they are doing. Um, now, eventually, when our creeps or a hero makes it up here, yeah, we can see like this area, but we have to be here under the tower. The tower could be hitting us or it's going to be killing off the creeps. So until we actually get up here, we don't know what's happening. And maybe on our way up here, they are waiting here to gank him immediately. Um, so it's scary. It's scary to come up here. And even if you have wards, like, let's say we place one here. You know, we can't see over here still, or like all the way over here in the back, in these trees. If we do... If we get a ward here instead, it's uncommon to have both. But let's say we have this one. Then yeah, again, we can see a good amount. But there's still stuff hidden away that we can't quite see. And even when Jug walks up here, again, our vision improves a little bit. But there's still a lot up here that we don't know about. And because we are on the low ground, it's easier for them to get a de-ward. Where they can feel safer de-warding from here, breaking our wards. Whereas... To even place a ward, we had to come all the way up here, which can be quite scary. If the enemy team has like a, a four staff or any kind of blink initiate, they could just kill us coming up here to try to place a ward. So in general, just having this ledge right here is a very big advantage for the defending team. And none of the high grounds, because of the trees blocking the way, like you could put a ward here, but you wouldn't really see much, would you? Um, by that green circle, we can see that even if we cut the trees, it would only give us a slight amount of vision. And that applies for like anywhere. Like the high ground on the opposite side just does not reach any of the uh, any of the defending team's like noticeable vision. It, it just like wouldn't really matter. And at nighttime, it's even worse. See, like even though we see less, like we still see out a little bit, um, which is still just better than you know seeing nothing at all then we have the fountain so the fountain is nearby that means you can throw out all your spells use up all your mana take a bit of harass and then take a 10 second run back to the fountain heal up run back and you're good and considering that a creep wave takes 30 seconds um, a creep wave spawns every 30 seconds so if you use all your spells wipe out the creep wave uh, as soon as they get to your front door you have 30 seconds till the next creep wave. You run back to fountain, heal up, come back. You're full health. If the enemy team has used any mana on you to try to harass you, like they're not going to get that back too quickly. They have a much longer time to regenerate, and it's just harder for them to heal up. So you have a lot more regeneration available to you. And because that's where you can buy items, or at least the items you can buy in base, not including the secret shop, if you complete any items or you need like oh i need more detection i need whatever you can buy it it's very quickly um, brought to you by your courier but if you're the uh, attacking team 
if you want to get anything from your fountain, like it takes a long time for the courier to make its way all the way over. Having said that, the attacking team does have a bit of an advantage in terms of getting to the secret shop because like they could just go back to yours real quick or their own depending where they are attacking from and like that's a little easier for them, but generally you're not in dire need of something from the secret shop, you know? I guess sometimes you are, and in fact, high ground does tend to create one of those opportunities where it's like, "Oh, I need something from the secret shop." But Let's not worry about that because it, it really isn't a huge deal in terms of breaking high ground. Um, connected to that with the fountain being nearby is buybacks, which let's say someone on the defending team gets killed. If they buy back, they're immediately at the fight again, pretty much. Like they might have to walk a little bit towards the high ground, but it's not that far. It's like a 10 second walk at most, depending on your move speed. Whereas if the attacking team were to die and try to buy back, there are, in fact, let's go to the map again. Let's say if we are Radiant and we were attacking this high ground and I die and I buy back. If I want to come here, where do I teleport? If I don't have bots to teleport to creeps, six second teleport to this and then run all the way up here. Or maybe I still have my tier one mid. I teleport here, run all the way over. Maybe even if I have my tier one here, run all the way down. It just takes so long. Even if I had all my towers and I had both outposts, like it's just a really long travel time. Whereas... If I die right here, buy back, and I'm already here. I can even teleport if I really need to, but this is like a five to ten second walk, so you know it's just a it's just a strong advantage for the defending team. Then you have the tower itself. Um, the tower provides damage, so it has an auto attack. It has its own health and armor, so it's not too easy to kill, depending on the enemy lineup. Sometimes it is actually pretty easy to kill, but let's hold off on that for now. But more importantly, maybe not more importantly, but what I want to talk about first is the aura that that tower provides. So tier three towers provide five armor and three HP regen. They also provide true sight. They also provide some vision. And so if we wanted to consider that in terms of items, the helm of iron will is probably the closest comparison where it provides five armor and five HP regen, which is two more than the tower provides, but it's still fairly similar. So just imagine that everyone on the enemy team that is under the tower has an extra Helm of Iron Will with them. That's like 5,000 gold for the enemy team. A little less, obviously, but like we'll say 4,500, something like that. But isn't that like quite a sizable amount? Five armor is like, it is anywhere between like a 10 and 20% increase in against physical damage. And that's that's not nothing. And the HP regen, you know, three is not game breaking, but it's still better than the attacking team's nothing. Nothing at all. You also get a free sentry, technically, if the tower is up with the true sight. And to an extent, it's like a free observer ward because the tower does provide vision. And so all of those are just a another advantage that the defending team has. Um, and that part is probably underestimated a bit, not appreciating that they have this extra armor and regen. Next, towers also have backdoor. That means that if you have no creeps there, the tower has backdoor protection. It takes significantly reduced damage in this time, and it will regenerate anything done to it. So let's say the tower's at 80% uh, health. It's got backdoor up, though, and you, your team starts attacking it. Your team, even though their damage is reduced, they do get it down to about 40%, and then they get pushed away. That tower will just heal back up to 80%. Or what did I say? I think I did say 80%. I've already forgotten. It will just heal all that damage back up. And so unless you can actually kill a tower, like it is possible, even though your damages are being reduced, to just kill a tower. It's just harder. Um, but if you kill it, it, it will die. But if you don't kill it, it just heals all the way back up. And so you would have taken some damage or uh, maybe used items and gotten nothing for it. Backdoor can be disabled and should be disabled by creeps being in the lane. So they have to get within a certain range. Um, so let's say this tower. Creeps have to get to about here where the symbol is um, to disable backdoor. And once, once, <laughs> once backdoor is disabled, the tower will now take permanent damage. So again, if it was at 80% health, but backdoor is disabled, your team does say 10% damage before they get pushed off. The tower is now at 70% and it will not regenerate. So that's why disabling backdoor is really important. 
However, there is another point of backdoor in that even when it is disabled, it still gives the tower a layer of protection from illusion heroes, where illusions will do 75% reduced damage when backdoor is up, and they will still do 60% reduced damage even when backdoor is disabled. So towers are just stronger against illusion heroes than heroes that have all the damage consolidated on the hero, if that makes sense. So like Naga ends up not being the best tower taker, even though like she seems like really strong fighting other heroes. But someone like like a Clinks or a Drow, where all their hero is consolidated like in that hero, they are pretty good against towers. Um, so even though they would probably lose a fight against Naga, like they're a better tower taker. Next, you have Fortify, which is an ability that makes all your towers invincible. It makes any existing creeps invincible. So if creeps just spawn and you use Fortify, they are invincible. But if you use Fortify and then the creeps spawn, those will not be invincible. Uh, it also gives your towers split shot, which will... So instead of attacking creeps one at a time, it'll very quickly kill off an entire creep wave. And there is no going through Fortify. The tower is invincible. So... Like, it's not like Backdoor, where you can go through it. Fortify does have a significant cooldown, though. So if you use it, you won't be able to use it again for a, a while. Right now, it is five minutes, but could change. If a Tier 1 tower is killed, let's say you use Fortify, and then a Tier 1 tower gets killed. Fortify gets refreshed. Otherwise, you have to wait the, like, the usual five-minute cooldown. Um, and for the defending team, because your tower will split shot, that tends to be an advantage where not only will it kill off the creep wave very quickly, but it will also help to deter enemy heroes because they could also be getting hit by the tower. And the tier two, the tier three tower does hurt like many heroes. Um, it won't kill them very quickly, but no one wants to just take tower shots for free. It's like close to 200 damage per hit. So even if you have a lot of armor, like you don't want to just be taking like a hundred damage for no reason. Um, especially because we're not near a fountain and we can't heal up quickly. So the split shot from Fortify is quite significant. Next, and finally, because this is your own base, so the defenders, they can split push other lanes. Like, let's, let's go back here. If I was the Radiant and the enemy team is pushing this tower, my carry can go push top out, and when a fight finally breaks out, they can TP right here, and they are in the fight. Whereas if you are on the offensive team, it's harder to do unless you have Boots of Travel, where if they wanted to go, say, push mid lane or top lane, and then a fight breaks out, like, they can't teleport here. Even if they had, like, all their towers, like, that's where their teleports are, and they, they just can't get here quickly unless they have Boots of Travel. But the risk of Boots of Travel teleporting to a creep, if that creep dies, your teleport's canceled. Um, whereas the defender, like, if he teleports here, there's no canceling this besides, like, hitting the hero and stunning his channel or canceling his channel. Um, it's just generally much safer to split push as a defending team and then come back rather than the offensive team trying to do that. That kind of covers all of these defense advantages. And I want to point out, most of these are inherent. So you don't have to understand that you have high ground advantage. You'll just get it. You will just get better vision. You will get that mischance against you. You don't have to understand that your fountain is nearby so that your items are there sooner or that you can buy back and be at the fight sooner. Like That just is the case. Even if you're a low-level player that didn't know any of this, like you just had these advantages without having to do anything. And what we're about to get into is like the offensive side, and we're going to realize their advantages are not nearly as significant as the defender's advantages. This is why breaking the high ground is so tough. For the attacking side, in terms of advantages, we have no advantages. We have options. That's kind of a joke, but also quite serious. Because as I was just saying, the defenders, their advantages, totally inherent. You don't need to know anything about these to just get the aura from the tower to get like any of that. You, you have no strategic need to understand any of that. You just get it. But for these, these are all things that technically... They can be advantages for the attacking team, but you have to know them and you have to intentionally apply them. Otherwise, you don't get them. 
And that's why so many people throw on high ground. They, they don't fully comprehend that the defensive team has all of these advantages and that, yes, the attacking team does have options, but many people just don't realize what those options are. And so they throw. So let's cover those. Towers do not heal. Ignoring like a Treant Protector or a Repair Kit, a level 25 Lich, um, there's just no way to heal a tower. So any damage that gets done stays, stays there. Um, so if you, like in one wave, you push the tower down to 70% health, you can leave for like as long as you want, and that tower will be at 70% health. And when you come back, you finally get another chance to push. That tower, still at 70%, you do another 30 damage to it, it's now down to 40% health, you come back a few minutes later, and you get the rest of it. So you can slowly chip the tower down, um, because it can't heal. What this means is that you can take it in many different ways. You can slowly chip away, like we've been describing, where even the, the heroes themselves don't even necessarily need to do anything. Um, this is very good in low levels, where you just push the creep wave to the enemy team, and the creeps will hit the tower. They're not going to do a lot of damage, but they're going to do some. And if you just keep the lanes pushed in, eventually that builds into something, and I do 100 damage, this creep wave, you know, a couple of minutes later, another creep wave does another 100 damage, another 100 damage later. Like, looking at the towers, this is a lot of health, but, you know, if every now and then you chip down like 100, 100, the catapult wave is there, so you, you do maybe like 400 that time, like, this tower is starting to slowly whittle away. And that can be very significant in low-level games where people are not quick to respond. They are not defending their towers soon enough, so they're just giving away free damage on their towers. Um, so if you're having a hard time going high ground, this can be an option for you, where you just slowly push waves in and let them do a bit of damage, and you don't commit to actually moving up to high ground and hitting the tower yourself. It's also an option if you are a hero like Drow Ranger or Sniper, who, with the right items and builds, they can outrange the tower. And so every time they push a creep wave up, they can slowly poke the tower down. Oh, something I forgot to describe about Backdoor, which some of you know. When Backdoor is disabled, it is disabled as long as a creep is there. And then when the last creep is killed, there are 15 seconds before Backdoor protection comes up. So even if you push your creep wave, let's say you're the attacking team, you push the creep wave all the way to the enemy's high ground, the enemy nukes that creep wave completely. They are dead within a second. You still have 15 seconds to hit the tower. The downside is that usually you don't have vision of the tower, right? The creeps were usually the ones providing uh, vision on the high ground for you. And so if the creeps are all dead, you lose that. Um, for a hero like Sniper, who can cast Shrapnel up there, that can be something he can do to make use of those 15 seconds where he can still damage the tower and the tower won't heal. You could put a ward on the high ground, but if you hit the tower in that case, you're kind of giving away the fact that you have high ground vision. So unless the tower is very close to dying, you may not want that. You could have a very tanky hero on your team. So like an Underlord or, I don't know, a Sand King who has defensive items and is ready to like blink away. Um, you could have them walk onto the high ground, give you vision, and then you know escape when they need to. If your other, if your team has some kind of high ground checking spell, some kind of vision spell, like a uh, you know a puck to cast illusory orb up the high ground, and you can hit it like three times and then back off. Three times is not a lot, but again, this tower does not heal. You can slowly chip it out, chip at it. So what this means is that the attacking team, like they can just keep at it. They can just keep pressure up in one lane and eventually they will get the tower the thing is this is not strictly an advantage so like yeah it's nice that you can slowly chip away the tower but sometimes that's all the defense needs it's like if we prevent them from taking our tower in one go and that they're only able to chip away at it like we're just trying to buy three minutes for our specter to finish up radiance and then when she finishes radiance we are going to be able to win a team fight and so if the defending team is able to limit the attacking team to only chip damage, that might be all they need. They're only trying to buy like a bit of time. So towers not healing is kind of an attacking advantage, but it's not like, it's not amazing. It's not on the same level of advantage as like a lot of these. It's just something you kind of have to make use of 
in order to eventually take a tower. Next, map control. This is something that is not always an option. So again, it's like an advantage, but not. If we look in the lobby, let's say, let's say this is actually what the game looks like. In which case, you are only able to push bottom to threaten this barracks. And any other one, you have to go get these towers. Um, but let's say you're losing really badly. You've lost all your towers. You've been trapped in your base. But you managed to win one miraculous fight, probably because you defended high ground. And you push all the way out and you try to get here. You don't have map control because your team is losing. And this is like your only choice. But now let's take the uh, scenario where your team is winning. You're the one that has slowly taken all the towers... A lot of your towers are still up. The enemy team is scared to leave their base. But they are still good at defending high ground. If they leave base, they'll probably be killed. But if they stay in base, they have like a Zeus, a Lena, a Keeper of the Light. They have like a Treant Protector who's healing the tower so you can't chip it away. They are very good at defending the high ground. And you are having a hard time. Even though you have like, uh, you've taken all the other towers, you're having a very hard time taking this high ground one. One of your options is map control, where because the enemy team is afraid to leave their base, you should just take this time to build your advantage. You should place a lot of wards in the area so that you can spot them anytime they're trying to leave their base. You know, any anywhere around this circle, let's say we're the, the Radiant, or if you're the Dire, like anywhere around here, and you just want to spot the enemy team if they ever try to leave their base, and you want to immediately go and react and keep them in here. And in that time, you want to de-ward as much as you can. So let's say you're the Dire. You want to de-ward this area so that they can't see what you're doing, whether you're like in the top lane or whether your team has moved over here. And you know, similarly for the, the Radiant team on the Dire side. And you want to just farm up the map. You want to keep lanes pushed in. Anytime a creep wave comes out, someone goes and pushes it back in. You guys are farming their jungle, pushing other lanes in. You don't even need to farm your own jungle necessarily. You just want to keep the enemy team in here. And the only farm this team is going to get is the creep waves you push in. They're not going to get any jungle camps. They are not going to be able to split solo XP because whoever is the one who has to kill the tower, the creep wave quickly, like say it's a Zeus and Lena, they have to kill the wave really quickly. Otherwise, you're going to do tower damage. But that means the specter that wants to farm, like, all right, I never get farm here. Maybe I can get farm here. But she has to put herself at risk. And that's a little scary. Um, and oftentimes several team members are going to have to be there to protect Spectre to make sure you guys don't just jump her. And so she is splitting all the experience amongst the rest of her team. And maybe she's getting the gold to herself, but the experience is being split up. Whereas for us, we are getting the creep waves from every lane, same as they are, but we're also getting the jungle. So sometimes we only have one person pushing top and then a couple people in the jungle, someone pushing mid. Later, we all head bottom. We're just getting a lot more experience and gold and keeping map control. And we can do this because we are in the lead. We are the attacking team. We have the advantage. And even though we can't go high ground, we are making sure they cannot leave their high ground. Again, this is a significant advantage to a winning team, but you have to know that that is the case. Where a lot of people go wrong is that they take all the tier 1 and tier 2 towers and they think, well, the next objective is high ground. Like, we just, what, el what else is there? We just have to go. I think I said the same thing in the very first video, the golden experience about how high ground is the dynamic benchmark. And it's like, you think oh, it's the next objective. Tier 1, tier 2, tier 3. Like, I have to. You don't. You can farm every wave. You can farm the jungle. And you can just build your advantage until you are now strong enough to take high ground. This is something many people don't do. Or they do incorrectly. For example, um, what you should often do, so let's say we're the Radiant team. Imagine all these other towers are down. We're Radiant. We should control this part of the map. And we should keep pressure here. Um, someone will farm the jungle. And fortunately, there's an ancient camp here. We are farming two waves. And all five of us are in this area. So that means if we have one guy here and he gets gone on, the rest of us can very quickly respond. And same like if I left Juggernaut here and the rest of us are like over here and they attack Juggernaut, we can all quickly run over and start a fight out here. Some people try to control the entire map. And that is possible sometimes, but you have to be careful. Because if you have one hero here, one hero here, one hero here, 
and then like someone in the jungle if the enemy team sees you're all split up and they all go for this guy yeah this one can respond and this guy might be able to get there in time but he is quite far away sometimes that's okay like this guy who's right here who's left alone maybe he'll just push high ground and he can take this on his own but if he really needed to be in this fight, he's not going to make it in time. And this can be a way for the defending team to, you know, get a kill or two. And now it becomes a 3v5 uh, for the attacking team. The attacking team has three people. And now they say, okay, we can't really pressure a lane, like three of us, even if we're all together, because the other five might just fight us. Um, so now we have to back off and the defending team gets to push out a bit and farm their jungle and they start to catch up. Sometimes, if you want to keep all three lanes um pushed in you have to move as a team so you prioritize this lane and then occasionally several of you make the move to go up here or you have a very elusive hero like storm spirit who should be very safe on his own and who can also cross the map very quickly um you have them deal with the top lane but if you have a very immobile team you want to just keep two lanes to yourself because this is still an advantage to you you have two lanes and you have the jungle and the enemy team only has one lane, so that naturally benefits you. This is how we can take advantage of map control. Next, Roshan's items, which we covered in the last video. This is somewhat known, like usually you want to get Aegis for the high ground, you want to get Cheese. But the thing is, the same reason it's not fully an advantage is because you don't have to use Aegis like that. It is simply in advantage in the game. You could use it for a mid game fight, you could use it for a fight at tier two. It, it's not strictly about the high ground. Um, again, whereas all the other defense advantages, like this is all stuff you get naturally at the high ground. If you don't know to go get Roshan, you don't have this advantage. If you know to get Roshan, but don't know who to put Aegis on, who to put Cheese on, and you put them on the wrong heroes, it's still somewhat of an advantage, but it's a bit wasted. You know, if you don't know how to make use of Aegis, give it to your tower taker so that he can safely chip the tower away that doesn't heal like this is why that combines so well is that the guy with aegis pushes the tower and the tower doesn't heal and he's safe because he has roche on or he has aegis and then okay the creeps are dead you back away and you just kind of repeat that roche on only lasts five minutes though whereas all the tower the high ground stuff that's permanent i mean when the tower falls you lose that but you know the high ground is always there it doesn't change it's not like a there's no earthquake that shifts the ground that would be kind of cool though but all of the attacking team's advantages are temporary or they have to be intentionally planned for. Now, Fortify is also not really an advantage, but it's something you can do where when you're, when you're pushing in your creeps, so that example where the enemy team has like Lena, uh, Zeus, Coddle, and like the creeps die before they even peek up their heads on the high ground. What you can do is you can fortify your creep wave, which makes them invincible which means they can't be nuked, which means for as long as your fortify is going, you will get high ground vision. And because you fortify when the enemy team is nuking, their nukes should be on cooldown, so they have to wait a little bit before they can kill that creep wave again, even when fortify ends. And so that gives you a bit more time to break high ground. This is used when you have a team that will shred the tower if you can actually get up there. So like you have a... Here's a good example. Leshrac or Beastmaster. They just need like five seconds to hit the tower safely and to do that they need the creeps to get on high ground to give them vision and to you know act as a buffer for the tower but when the enemy team keeps nuking them right away yeah technically backdoor is down but now leshrac has to walk up high ground himself the tower is hitting him the enemy could hit him you know that's very scary he doesn't want to do that but you fortify your creep wave they run up high ground they can't be killed even if the enemy team fortifies like it kind of cancels out a bit um and then Leshrac has time to shred the tower with his abilities. If you're a team that chips the tower, so like you don't do a lot, but you're just slowly whittling it down, fortifying your own creep wave loses some value because it's like, okay, we bought ourselves five seconds, but we did 200 damage in that time, and now our fortify is down. Um, for, for many people, I don't strictly recommend trying to use fortify to push. It is a fairly high-level play, I think, that you need to know what you're doing. But, I mean, yeah, go ahead and try it. If you're crushing it, and you're, like, never going to need Fortify, and you have, like, Tier 1 Towers up, then, yeah, like, just use it. Who cares? But, yeah. 
This can also be very good against like Tinker, who has been like destroying the wave. Um, those kind of heroes. I feel like there's something else I wanted to say about Fortify. Oh, a it's not really a it's not as good, but it's like an alternative. Just buying a pipe to pipe your creep wave, uh, so they don't get killed by the nuke immediately. That is like a a poor man's Fortify. Although technically you need to spend money for that one, so it's like a rich man's Fortify. I don't know, um, but that can be an option as well when you need to buy your team or buy your creep wave a bit of time so it's like you can survive two more nukes than usual and that will let you hit the tower for a little bit but yeah just to reiterate again none of these are inherent advantages to the attacking team you don't always have roshan you're not always going to want to use fortify sometimes you don't even have map control but that should be the case if you're the winning team and if you don't have map control and you think you're winning then maybe that's what you should do instead of trying to breach high ground you should go establish map control um, and the tower's not healing. I would say that is an inherent advantage, but it, it's not a very strong one. And so now that we've covered all of this, you know, looking at the defense one, I'll leave this one up because I think this is probably more important. Like when we think about both, doesn't it make sense that the defending team has such a strong advantage? When a fight breaks out, they can buy back, they can do that. I will say that about the buyback, where if you're significantly in the lead, you don't necessarily need to save for buyback because you're like, whatever, if we die here, it's whatever. Oh, I should have put that on the advantage of the attacking team, actually. So if we look at... Let's look at the map. I'll just explain this real quick for you guys. If we're the Radiant and we fight here and we die, what can... And we had our lanes pushed in. We had our map control. What can the Dire team do? In terms of our objectives, if we had every tower up, they probably need to take like 30 seconds to get down here. And it takes a really long time to get all the way here. Even if you go straight down mid lane, this is probably about 40 to 50 seconds. Uh, a little less, actually, at this point. Heroes are generally faster. But for your creep wave to get there, and then you have to like kill the enemy creeps and all that, like let's say 30 seconds to get all the way down. Many of you will be close to respawning at that time. Um, and then even more time if they have to like take the tier 1 and then take the tier 2 tower. Um, by the time they finally get to your high ground, you've respawned, so it's not so scary. But what if we're the Radiant here and we win a team fight against the Dire? Well, because we're up here, assumedly our creep wave should also be like very close by, and then we are ready to start taking objectives off the back of this team fight right away. So winning a team fight here is great for us as the Radiant because we get to take objectives, and if we lose a team fight here, it's usually not so bad because we're quite far away from our objectives. So that is something that probably should have been on the attacking uh, advantage. But I, okay, I, I'll give myself some benefit. Where again, that is not strictly a benefit of taking high ground. Like, it doesn't make it easier to take high ground because you've done that. And it, it and honestly, it kind of just falls under map control, what I just explained. Like, the fact that we are on their side of the map favors us in terms of winning or losing the fight. The results of that fight. But being on their side of the map favors them in terms of like being able to win the fight, if that makes sense. So the results of the fight favor us. The actual fight will favor them because we're closer to their stuff. And then they have all the advantages we talked about where you know they could buy back, get to this fight, all that. So what we're going to do now is talk about positioning. So now we're going to... This is something you should know for every role. Um, and you can tell your team like, oh, we shouldn't go high ground yet. Let's go back off. Um, but now we're going to talk about hard support specific things, um, focusing especially on positioning. That is the most common mistake I see in terms of defending or attacking the high ground is bad positioning by the hard support. So we're going to talk about how to position mainly, um, and then we'll look at some examples. So now we're going to imagine some scenarios that we are pushing the high ground and we as the hard support, like what should we do? preface this all by saying this only applies in close games that are you know relatively close even if you're in the advantage you know it could still you could still lose all of this applies if your game is an absolute stomp and the enemy team has like given up again rules don't apply then you can just do whatever but in most games it will be close when you're coming to the high ground what should you do as the hard support the very first thing i want you to know is so important, I'm going to adopt an absurd accent so that the 
increased absurdity sticks out in your mind and this will never leave, okay? Look at this tower. This tower has 16 armor and 2,500 health. When you attack a tower, not only because this is a tower and you do reduce damage, but then it has significant armor as well, you as a hard support do very little damage to this thing. And so, never, and I cannot stress this enough, ever hit this tower for the most part. Goofy accents aside, your auto attacks on this tower are so useless. Never hit this thing, okay? If I wanted to hit this thing as Jakiro, ignoring that I have liquid fire, let's just pretend I'm a regular hero, I have pretty short attack range. I have to walk up high ground to hit this thing. People who have slightly longer attack range will probably stand somewhere here and attack it. But guess what? Because you're on the low ground, you have a chance to miss. So that reduces the usefulness of your attacks. Then, like we said, this has a lot of armor. It is a structure as well. So your hero attacks do reduce damage to it. And your hard support. So you never built a lot of damage. You shouldn't have been. Um, you didn't build a lot of damage. Jikiro is a very unique case where he has liquid fire. Um, and even then, I am very careful to attack this tower with liquid fire. Because look at this positioning. You are in their base. Remember that whole spiel we went on about the advantages of high ground and all that? This is such a bad spot to be in. Jug will be up here hitting this tower, but not in this case because he has divine rapiers and he would just kill the tower. Do you see how close I am to Jug? Do you see why this is an issue? If they have any form of AoE initiation, I'm going to get caught with Jug. How am I supposed to help Jug if I'm being killed right on their door? Like, couldn't I have used Glimmer or Force Staff from back here? I would have had to move up a little bit because their cast ranges are really short. But couldn't I have used Ice Path from back here to put on top of Jug so anyone hitting him would get stunned? Technically, I can do that from here. But technically, I'm just going to die here. If this tower starts hitting me, it takes like five tower shots to kill me. That's an exaggeration, but it does not take a lot to put me within um, kill range for the enemy PA or whoever to just dagger me and kill me. Never hit this tower. It is not your job. Never, ever. Except sometimes. Again, if the enemy team is all dead, sure, just walk up. Who cares? If your team is crushing it, sure, who cares? If the enemy team is close to respawning, but you guys are in a desperate situation and you really need to take buildings, then yeah, maybe your pitiful 30 damage does matter. But in most games, it does not. And you should never walk up here. Look at this. This is a lot. If I take four tower shots, five tower shots, I'm almost dead. And it's not that weird to be level 10. I mean, obviously, this is a custom lobby, so we're like at the high ground at like seven minutes. But... Chikiro, pretty tanky hero as a whole, so it would not be that weird for other supports to be like level 15 and around these stats. Five tower shots, and now I am now within like two nukes from like the enemy mid, a Zeus to bolt and cue me, and I'm dead. For a PA to crit me, and I'm dead. For Clinks to walk up, hit me with three auto attacks, and I'm dead. Like, and what did I get? I got 60 damage off on the tower for hitting it twice. Never, ever walk up here. Never ever walk up here. Never ever walk up here. This is all too close. There's no need to ever approach that far. Only when they actually go on your core here do you now walk up and assist. As much as possible, when your team is sieging the high ground, you should just be hiding in the back behind trees. You should be hiding in the back over here. Thinking back to our team fighting video about positioning in a spot that lets you do your job, if I am, say, Jakiro, and my job is to ice path when they go on Juggernaut to stun several of them and then set up like a macro pyre in dual breath to start slowing and damaging them. Macro pyre will also set up a zone where the enemy team doesn't want to go. Where is my job for that? My job is back here. My job is not to hit tower. And that's what many people forget. They think we need to take towers and I want to go contribute. You are contributing nothing. You do like 20 damage per auto attack. It's awful let the carry who does like okay he, he wouldn't have rapiers of course but with their items with their scaling with their abilities someone else is your tower taker do not walk up and try to take the tower as the hard support 
I know there are some examples. Shadow Shaman does walk up to places ultimate. Jakiro does have liquid fire. Um, some fives. Actually, I guess it's really just tree and protector who might build meteor hammer might find value in doing that. Yes, but you still have to be really careful. Meteor hammer in particular, like you're in tower range, they'll see you channeling it. They might go for you. Um, so be very careful with that. Jikiro is usually okay because Liquid Fire gives him additional attack range. Plus, he is a very good uh, holder for the neutral items like uh, Telescope. Where is it? Telescope or even um, sometimes I take Grove Bow for the increased attack range if there's nothing better. Um, sometimes I take the attack talent so that if my team doesn't have good damage and I know that I need to be chipping away the tower with Liquid Fire, I take that talent so that... In fact, let's show it. With... With the uh, attack talent and all that. Hold on, Judd, get up there. I can hit the tower from back here. And this is very safe. I am not in, I'm not in tower range here. Um, and I can stand in the back, mostly out of sight, and then pop in, hit it, and then back off. And there is a risk to me when I walk up here. So I'm still careful about doing this. If I can't see the enemy initiator, um, if I can't see... The carry who can just delete me, I don't walk up and do this, even if I have liquid fire. Knowing your job as a hard support is very important, and my job is not to take towers. It is to provide support for my carries who will take the towers. So, let's say this high ground. Here is a decent spot to be, over to the side, anytime you're behind trees, over here. Your team can even be smoked up so that you can stand like here, and your smoke won't break from like any of the enemy heroes standing around here. Um, and it won't break from the tower. But even if they like have a, a ward here and can see out here, because you're smoked, they won't see you. That's also good. That's fine. Um, if we're sieging this high ground, your carry should be standing around here, and you position behind them. You know? Even if you're a frontliner like Ogre or Undying, in those cases, you will push up a little more but you should still be conscious to not stand next to Jug. So let's say, let's say Jug is standing like right here. Give him a heart so he doesn't die. Let's say Jug is standing right here. Actually, Jug should be standing over here um, because there's less places people can jump him from over here, whereas there are more places that enemies can stand up here. So then you as Ogre should be like over here, but you should not cross too far. You should not go past the tower. You should still stay, like, back here, where if your team wants to get out, it's very close for you to get out. But that if Jug's, like, over here, and you're over here as Ogre... Ah, oh, shoot. He wasn't supposed to do that. But if, uh, let's pretend Jug was here attacking this tower, and Ogre's here. You know, if they have a Slarder who wants to blink and initiate, it's hard to get both of us. And if you see a Slarder standing here to initiate... You should swap, actually. Juggernaut should be further away, and you should be closer. So that when Slaughter wants to walk in, you can stun him, you can ignite him, um, you can cancel that blink, and then you back off again. Like, okay, I've stopped his blink, and initiate, I'll now back up and let Juggernaut do his thing. Um, you never want to put yourself in, like, too far of a danger. For other backline heroes, like hard supports usually are, um, so let's say your carry... Like, your carry can be anywhere in this triangle right here. So, like, doot, 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 doot. That could be where they're hitting, they're hitting this from, right? Where they have, uh, like, your ranged heroes will be in this area. Your melee heroes will be in this area. And so if you have melee heroes who are standing here, then you will stand behind them somewhere like here. And if your ranged heroes are standing here, then you will stand behind them, like, in a bigger arc. Do you see how you always keep yourself, like, the carry is in the middle... Then you're back here, and the tower is on the other side. You're as far away from the enemy team as you possibly can be, while still keeping in mind that whole um, team fight discussion and positioning thing of, I need to be close enough to do my job. If I'm a Dazzle, I need to be close enough to grave quickly. My melee carry hitting this tower, I need to be close enough to grave very quickly. So if I stand right here, um, I would probably be within range of uh, grave cast range. But this is still quite a safe positioning. I'm not under tower. I'm not going to take tower hits. I am quite safe. Let's get rid of these creeps. We don't need them anymore. Um, anytime behind trees, like this stuff is good, because even if they have a ward here, they can't see through trees. 
all good stuff. For this high ground, like um, here's a little too up, I think, but like over here is okay because you're behind the trees and you're far away. Like keep in mind this like triangle area, that is where the core will be and you will not be in that area. Ah, uh, whatever. That's just going to spam off. Let's just ignore that. For the other side, I don't think we really need to go into it the same... Wait. I already blinked like most of the way, but... <laughs> we'll remember to use that teleport. Ah, oh, okay, this is going to be really annoying. Um. Oh, you know what? I don't even have... I didn't even have desktop volume recording. You guys have just been listening to this in silence. Whatever, it's fine. Um, and then again, where this side, there's the triangle, that's where your core is, so you're gonna be, like, back here, back here. You never want to, like, walk up too close to, like, here. This is also awkward, where, where, uh, like, they could be right here and they could go on you. And I want to point out, we're gonna go back to the advantages and disadvantages of the, uh, are these, okay, these towers will be fine. We're not gonna, like, end the game too early. I want to point out another advantage de uh, disadvantage for defenders versus offense. Let's say we're defending and we're having a good fight, so we want to push up. I can come out here. And yeah, I've left behind a lot of my high ground advantages, but I'm not entering an increased danger zone. Whereas if I'm over... <sighs> we're remembering, guys. We're getting there. Whereas what if our team is here and my jug was here? And then Jug wants to go in and start fighting up here. If I want to keep in position to assist him, I now have to walk up here. And I am in a in a more dangerous area where I have I'm now on the same level ground, so I've lost my low ground disadvantage. But I'm now under the tower. I am now further away from safety where some of my pathways are cut off. I am now like forced to funnel out. Um I am under the enemy's strength. Um where they, they have their aura from the tower, their true sight, all of that. So, like, a glimmer cape won't work under here. My, I'm just, like, in a worse spot. When the enemy comes down here to fight us, they lose all their advantages. Well, a lot of them. So, they're, they're losing the tower. They're losing the high ground. Fighting out here is, like, okay for us. Um, so, when we pull them out to fight, like, that favors us. But it doesn't, it's not necessarily bad for them in the way that, like, yeah, you're losing your high ground advantages, but I'm not running under an enemy tower here. I'm not running under their true sight, potentially, if they have, like, wards and stuff, I guess. But, like, chasing as a defender is usually less risk than chasing as the attacker. Where, especially because this tower is killing off your creeps, once it's done killing the creeps, it's going to hit you. And it's like, if my jug's over here and I have to, like, run up to help him, I have to ice path... And it's like, I want to get out now. But, like, I'm pretty much dead. And that was as fast as I could have done it. I, I walked up, I ice path, and I backed off. I didn't even use my other spells, which probably would have gotten me killed. And even if you're a bit stronger, like, let's level up a little bit. Let's level up, like, let's get all the way to 18. Oh, wait. It's, uh, I think it's just level up. Okay. My stats really aren't that much better. And even if I come up and do the same thing, like, let's come up, cast ice path macro pyre and then back out that's as fast as i could do it and i still lost uh over half my health let alone if i have to stand there and cast liquid fire dual breath maybe glimmer the guy um like any of that and i might just die to the tower don't even forget that they have five enemy heroes who are looking at me and seeing a low health support and thinking like wow we could use the gold for that kill like i'm dead that's why it's so bad in general when cores run all the way up here to fight. Because even though they are okay, we are not okay to go up there. And so you have to caution your team. Like, please do not, like, get this tower. If the tower is dead, like, let's come over here where the tower has fallen. Let's say the tower is dead, but the barracks were still up. If Juggernaut wants to fight up here, I can now follow him up. And the creeps might spawn and attack me. But it's like... It's whatever. They're nothing compared to the tower. And then eventually my creeps will get here and I can de-aggro the creeps onto our own creeps. It's like, it's it's just not an issue. But the tower does a lot. Look at that. 200. 
And these also do, like, now there's two towers. So if your carry's here taking two tower hits, and I'm here taking two, uh, taking a tower hit, it's like we're fighting five of our heroes versus five of the enemy heroes plus all of these. And look, I do 111 damage. This has 200 damage. This has a 0.95 attack speed or, or a bat base attack time. What do I have? I have 1.3. This tower is better than me at pure auto attacks. And I do reduce damage to the tower. Uh, I think the tower does full damage to us. You know what? Let's check. Yeah, like 150. That's about right. So they do full damage to us. I knew that. Um, and so you're just adding yourself extra enemies when you're coming under here. Sometimes your team is so strong you can do that. But many times you're not. And I know you've had teams that still try to dive under tower. And that is why we throw. This is because like, look at this. My health, it's gone. Positioning is very important. Now, if we come over here to defend, let's talk about the defense side. It's very much the same thing where this is where the enemy is going to be, which means where should your carries be? Your carry should be in this circle somewhere there. If they're a core hero, if they're a melee hero, sorry, they might be a little closer. Um, but more than likely, your melee heroes might be waiting for a moment, and so they're also standing here. Your ranged heroes can stand in the same area and attack. And if my ranged heroes are here, and my core is here, should I be standing here with them? No. Because even though we talked about how diving is generally not good, if the enemy team is fairly strong, they might see two of us together and decide, okay, let's go blink initiate on them. Jakiro can't help the, uh, the drow because we just stunned him next to her, and we can kill both of them right here. That's why I need to be further back. And if I'm back here, can the enemy team ever really initiate on me? Even if they have high ground vision here and an abyssal or a blink. Actually, if they have blink abyssal, yes, they could blink here and then abyssal me. That is something to keep aware of. But you should recognize how far the enemy team can initiate from. And it's usually up to about here because that is where like the initiator would stand somewhere here. And with blink and whatever they're initiating with, so like... Blink Ravage probably reaches the farthest, where he could stand here, Blink to about here, Ravage, and Ravage reaches out to about here. But what about, like, Blink Black Hole? He stands here, Blinks here, and then Black Hole at most from there could probably reach around here. And that's why I'm standing back here, you'll notice, because this is at the edge of as far as Enigma could possibly reach. Or, like, Centaur, who blinks here and stuns here. Like, I am standing outside of the initiation range so that I cannot be killed. And when my support, or when my carry gets gone on, I can assist, I can glimmer, I can four staff, whatever. Um, but if I am too far up, I cannot defend this tower. I will also note, this particularly applies with buyback. If you die as a support, let's say you have some team members dying. We kind of saw this yesterday, where you buy back and you just die right away, right? So let's say you buy back, some of your team are still dead, and you're like, oh, I got to defend this tower. So I, I cast a nuke right here. Actually, let's, let's say you're Jakiro. Jakiro is one of the better heroes for this, but it can still happen to Jakiro. Where it's like, oh, I got to dual breath these creeps who are right here. And then the Slardar who is right here blinks on top of you, and they go on you and kill you. And you just bought back and died. This is a huge throw. This is a big issue with defending. Where some people will buy back because they feel like they need to, but actually they can't do anything alone. They can't even approach to do anything alone. This is a positioning issue. Where you need to realize that... If I buy back, yeah, I've got defensive spells. But in order to use them, I would have to come up here, which is too close. This is actually too close against several teams, most teams. Anytime they have like any form of blink initiate, anytime the carry, like a PA can blink to you with their ability and kill you. Um, Jug can very quickly like run in, face boots run in, abyssal you. You have to know how far you can approach safely. And if you can, like let's say Coddle. Coddle could stand back here and blast the wave. And that would be fairly safe because even from here, like uh, Blink gets you to about here. And yeah, if they have Blink Abyssal, they could kill you. But um, depending on what point of the game is, they may not want to tank these two towers. But if they had Blink Abyssal, yeah, maybe you don't want to stand here. But if they just have Blink and they're like a centaur, maybe you can come up here and channel your spell. You do have to be a little careful if they like Blink um, Stampede at you. Uh, that's certainly something you might want to be careful of. But, I mean, does that make sense? You just, you have to know how how far in you can walk to defend. 
you know, for this tower, I can probably stand somewhere back here where like this is a decent spot. Like my ice path reaches here, but I'm not really at risk where one person might be up here hitting this tower, but the rest are back here. And these are the ones I'm scared of, like the ones waiting to blink initiate. If several of them are walking up here, then maybe I want to stand even further back until someone else goes in. This is why it's important to have initiators versus counter initiators versus frontliners. Um, so like if I like if I have no frontliner, I have to stand back here because I'm afraid of them blinking initiating on me. But if I have a frontliner to stand like right here and cancel their blinks, well now I can move up and I can cast my spells, and I'm not that scared because they can't blink on me because like our our frontline ogre or whatever canceled all their blinks or like our frontline centaur has no way to cancel blinks but maybe he runs in hits them all with something and then backs off so the the blink is off cooldown for a little bit and i can come up and cast a spell maybe he's not the best sand king is like an okay frontliner like he'll stand here channel sandstorm so that people can't run up and blink like that could work um but no you have to set a limit to yourself and know how far you can walk forward in terms of positioning to defend your tower we actually watched some of this game yesterday, but I think we're going to use that as an example for high ground push. First, I'm going to point out something I think is a mistake, where I think I mentioned this yesterday too, maybe before, where these guys just got Roshan, so he has Aegis now, and they just took this mid tower, and that's why they're feeling really strong. They want to push high ground, probably because DK is still dead. That is fair, um, but I also feel like they should consider getting the other towers first. Because right now, after all we've discussed, we know that high ground fights can be very hard. Even these go even though these guys are in the in the lead and they are feeling very strong, high ground fights are scary. So when you win one, you want to be able to get as much as you can out of it. In this case, if they win this high ground fight, they could take our barracks mid. It is unlikely they could end the game because our team we might be willing, we might buy back to defend this, and I, I would say we should. Um, and so if we buy back and still lose the fight, we could then, like, I think they could just end mid. But if we lose this and say we just give it up, um, like some of us die and we choose not to buy back, so it's like, okay. And they decide to come up here. If we buy back now, this is a bit scary for them because, like, this is one tower, but now this is two towers, and these are hitting, like, uh, it's like just double the damage of this first tower. So it's a little scary to fight there. And any creeps that spawn here will like immediately fight them. That's not nothing. Um, the point is, that would be their only other option is to end the game. Whereas usually, the way backdoor works for the high ground is that if backdoor gets canceled here, like a creep makes it here, even if this in this wave, the creeps are actually out here, the equilibrium's here, all tier threes, their backdoors are all broken when one creep walks up. So, if you have it set up so they had this tower, that means they only have to win this fight here. They can take this Rax, and then they can run top and take this. And even though they won't have creeps to tank this tower, Lifestealer is plenty strong enough to just kill this tower on his own, um, let alone with the help of his uh, buddies. And then they could get two sets of Rax based off one high ground fight. But because they left these towers up, if they win this fight, they're only going to get one Rax. And when they want to get another set of Rax, they have to go take this tower, and now they have to win another high ground fight here. And I think that is harder. So I don't blame them for going high ground here because Dragonite is still dead. But sometimes, like let's say Dragonite wasn't dead, then I think this is the wrong choice. I think you should go get these towers, set yourself up so that if you win one major fight, you could possibly even get all three sets of Rax, Getting these towers will give them more map control. They can do some of the stuff we talked about if they wanted to. It also gets them gold so they could finish up some extra items to make them even stronger before going for this high ground fight. Forcing this high ground here is because DK is dead, I think, and because they are feeling strong. But I don't necessarily know if it's the, the best idea. I don't feel like it is. Let's talk about positioning. I'm the position five in this game. Look how far back I am. And it's because I'm scared. Even though this guy's a melee hero, I know he can phase up to me. He can use open wounds. He just used rage now, but let's say he hadn't. I'm just dead. Rubik is just dead. Any of us that approach will just die. Pango, he can swashbuckle and hit us from pretty far away. So like uh, he could swashbuckle to about 
how far is this thing? Yeah, so he could swashbuckle to about here, and then it would hit around Rubik. So Rubik's positioning is a little scary to me, and in fact, I believe they might go for him soon here. Like that. And you see how he slowed, and they even look to go for it, but because he has rage, they back off. Like, this is why we as the position fives had to be so far back. Even though they don't have a usual blink initiator, like uh, Slardar or Sand King, like, I recognize if this guy runs up to me and open wounds, I'm just dead. There's no way I get away. And so I have to be as far back as possible. Now that they have used some of their spells and they are forced to retreat and I have teammates running in, I know that they're going to want to back up, so I'm willing to run in a little bit more. But still trying to keep some distance. So let's look at both teams once this guy comes out. Uh, well, he, he went and pounced in. But at this point, notice how Lifestealer is the front line slash core. Um, and then these guys backed off. Um, because they don't want to all get caught up together in, like, Puck Ult, in, uh, in any, like, AoE stuff from me. Um, get hit by, like, Dragon Breath, Fade Bolt, and then their damage is all reduced. They are keeping their distance um, and letting this guy be the one up front. And I walked up too far. Honestly, I did not expect Slark to pounce this way. I don't know if that was a mistake or what. I thought we were going to get this guy. And that's why I was here to Ice Path. And possibly hit other people so that they couldn't immediately run up to him. And then I thought Slark was going to hit him. And then we, like, maybe not Dream Coil because Aegis is still up. So I don't want to commit that quite yet. But, like, we had Lift and everything. Oh, no. Maybe it's still on cooldown. Um, but, like, this guy is teleporting in. He has Blink Stun, whether that's good or not this game. But because of that, like, look. He just runs in. This guy was too close. Just dies. Let me, like, let's emphasize that. Let's emphasize how... How many people would have made this mistake, I think? Where he is like, isn't this far enough? He's a ranged hero. He's a melee hero. It's not. Look at him. He just sprints at him and kills him. I was sped up, so you didn't get to see it that well. But, like, now look at me. Like, I'm too far up, even though I'm trying to contribute to the fight. And I kind of have to be because the way the fight ended up going. But it's, like, real awkward. And even though they are diving and killing us, you see how these guys are zoned out because... They can't approach under this tower. And now it's getting weird because they're up here. They have to back out. Overall, I think this fight was okay for us. And I think that's because although these guys were ahead, they were not appreciating the high ground um, benefits. Like, look, they're 5k ahead. Remember what I said about the helm, uh, the will stuff? You know, it's not the greatest comparison, but if you gave us all an iron helm of the will or Wilm of the Helm of the Iron Will, whatever it is. It's kind of even in terms of net worth, even though they're so far ahead. And any fight outside has essentially been a win for them. Um, because of the benefits of this, the attacks, everything like that, they did get some kills, but they lost Aegis. Like, they didn't get that much out of it. And this is overall very good for us, even though I had to buy back and I was pointing out mistakes we were making. Um... Our team, in theory, the later this goes, should be strong. Like, I do think ignoring... I, I think some of our item builds are wrong, so, like, whatever. But in terms of heroes, like, I think this guy could become extremely scary where he has, like, BKB um, and a bunch of other stuff. And then Dream Coil with Ags. Um, DK eventually is a frontliner. I pump out a lot of damage and will have a lot of uh, stuns with Ice Path and then, like, later talents. Rubik eventually like has very great steals and so like i think we could win team fights if this goes later and so i'm like okay with this going badly not going badly but like yeah they got like half the tower and we died but like we're not dead like we just talked about how if we really lost this fight we could lose barracks and lose the game so like this didn't go the worst for us here is another high ground push they do so i think this is slightly a mistake where last time they took half of our mid tower and now they're pushing top. Part of it is just because they did just get this tower. Um, and so they feel like, okay, let's now push top. I personally think that's a mistake. I think um, they should go mid and come back because they only have to do half of this tower, which is uh, you know, not the full tower. It's just faster to do mid. Um, but I think because they have a lot of creeps here, they're like, okay, let's just push it and see. And you know what? Honestly, that's fine. 
to push this creep wave in because we are split up on the map so they can get a bit of damage here and then back off and go mid i think that's okay as soon as he starts getting here so i want to point out this positioning so carry is up here hitting the tower this carry in particular life stealer also happens to be a frontline style hero who can do this he can just put himself up here and he's not that scared because he has rage and infest and he's just very strong this game Underlord is a frontlining hero, but this guy's frontlining, so there's no point to stand next to him. He'll stand back here where he can provide auras, and he can cast his spells, and he can make sure to start Dark Rift immediately if the fight looks bad. Ogre, usually a frontline style hero. Doesn't need to be because of this guy's here. And then he's here, so why stand next to Underlord where they might both get, say, um, Dream Coiled or like both get Ice Path together? Why not stand even further back? Because he does not have to actively cast Bloodlust on this guy. He can cast it once and then back away. And if someone goes on him, he can then run in, cast Ignite and Fire Blast. He's far enough away where, you know, he can cast Medallion as needed and then back up and then run back in. Medallion, back up. Marana doesn't need to be up close. She arrows. Look at her. Standing back here in the trees. This guy standing to the side, ready to initiate. He feels very safe. Rubik, way back here. Learned his lesson. Doesn't want to be anywhere near this guy because he'll get run at and killed. The rest of us, kind of out of position. He's running in. I sh we should have responded sooner to this. Um, I don't know why I was so late. So here's Fortify, the split shot, and the enemy... Yeah, the enemy also fortified, because they didn't want to lose this push, which... I don't know. I guess because they had the catapult, but I, I don't think they need to do this. Um, but... He is a hero that could kill this cat this tower so fast. Like, look how much he's done already. He, he was that close to going on this Rubik, who is all the way back here. Um, you know, this is a mistake that many supports make. They, like, come up here. They would come up even closer. Like, Rubik barely gets away because he has a four staff, and he was here, which is, like, very far. What I see a lot is supports, like, walk up as far as up to here and then just die. Um, and that is just no good. Like, look how much tower damage they did in this time. So this is what they were scared of, where... Because Lifestealer ran in to go aggressive, they were forced to run in as well. Like, we can't leave Lifestealer alone against five. We have to come in as well. Now we are all under the tower. This tower is currently hitting Lifestealer, which is okay, because he's the tankiest. But now they all have to back away. Um but it has already grouped them up in this funnel. Marana should not be hitting this tower. I think that's a mistake. Um, and now they get three-man Dream Coil. It's going to work out okay for them because they're so far ahead of us. Um, I know it's only 6k, but because of our, our itemization is bad, it's like further than that, really. Um, and like our combo is really good. We have a three-man Dream Coil. I've got Macro Pyre on all of them. I'm going to... Uh, Oh, I almost had the Ice Path off, but this guy stunned them because he had the BKB. Like, we have them all trapped here, Dream Coiled. We have several AoE spells. This was really good for us overall in terms of the positioning because they, like, ran up so far and we went in. Um, but because he was able, able to counter-initiate with his BKB and his roll, and that kind of bumped me forward, I'm now out of position, and we don't have the items to really, like, keep this fight up, where now I'm dead... He still has to position far back. Puck making some space. Now that this tower is technically... like, See how much damage they did to this tower? That would be this tower dead. That's why it's usually better to go back to the same lane and identify like which tower is weakest and go to that lane. Um, also, our team properly split pushed. Um, so our creeps are over here. So technically their only option is mid right now. Um, but you notice we skipped forward, so now these towers are dead. So if they win a significant fight here, they can just head over mid. Um, but I think they, after getting this top tower, this is the last one they need to get. I think they should just back up from there, push mid, probably top as well. Usually you pick this area to control, like you stand here and push in these two towers. But because Roshan is close to spawning, I would actually say you take mid and top, and that way... Even if we want to split push this lane, then it's like, oh, a Roche fight. It like takes so long to get here. Whereas if they take control of this, can I draw? Uh, I guess I can't draw on this. Um, but whereas if we take control of this area and then like split push top, then if a Roche fight breaks out, like it's so close to get here. So for the Radiant, they want to control top and mid this game. Or in this push, I think. 
All right, I want to use this game as an example of um, essentially doing stuff you shouldn't be able to do, but you can get away with it. We were we should have been winning this game, but Ember got really tilted and just refused to play with us. Um, so I ended up getting killed here. The enemy team just got Aegis. They know that our team is in disarray right now um, because we were we were winning winning really hard, and now they've caught up because they like our team has just not been playing together. Um, so now. They're going to push this. They have Aegis. They think they have the advantage. Which, like, technically, we're still in the lead. Like, that's how ahead we were. Um, but now they have caught up. And they feel they're in the advantage because our team's not playing together. So they're going to be able to get away with some stuff that they should not be able to here. So look at this. Look how bad this is. They all walked up here. Now, this is a really weird game because this guy's, like, position... What was this game? I think this was position 5 bat and position 4 void. Or it might have been the other way. Either way, these are the supports. This is the off lane, carry, mid. Um, and so, like, they're all up here. They don't care because they feel like they can do whatever this game. And they sort of can. Like, Ember is just pushing bottom, um, which is sort of okay, except for the fact, like, he just never comes here. Let's back up a little. I didn't want to buy back at first because I thought maybe our team can hold it. We have a lot of AoE clear. Like, we should have an Ember, but he wasn't joining the team. So I didn't know if I wanted to come in yet. They don't need both of these guys up here. They're both taking Sunray damage. Well, he's not yet, but he could be soon. Um, I think it's bad for both of them to be up here. Then they initiate like this, so I buy back because they seem to be committed really far in. Now Ember finally comes in. Slark died, unfortunately. Uh, I think he should have ulted a little sooner. But like, even though these guys had Aegis, they came in too far. And they didn't take the fight, like, that seriously. They're still winning. But I don't think it was as clean as it should have been. Like, look at them. They're all running in into all of our spells. It, it shouldn't work if our team had been more coordinated. Um, that's why it was so it was so frustrating, this game. And then I'm going to die. Oh, no, I made it. But they've taken a lot of damage for it. And they're scared to stay too long. So I think they back out here. I think someone probably could have committed and died for this. That would have been okay. But our team ultimately does hold here. But, like, did you see how bad that was? They were, like, all grouped, all walking up. Even though, like, what do these guys add to the tower hit? What do, like, Void Spirit and Bat Rider do? They don't do anything. They have no need to stand here. Bat Rider even has a blink. This guy has his ult to get in close. They have no reason to stand in this area right here. That was so annoying to see. So, I skipped some stuff where they, we lost top, same as mid, in a very similar fashion to what we just watched, so I skipped forward. Our team is finally starting to play together. We had this miraculous hold where um, like they had Ancient at like almost dead, one-third, but we held it. And because of that, and th that they wiped on it, I think my team started to play together because they were like, oh wait, even though we got tilted for like 30 minutes, maybe we can still win. So now... When I said, like, their push should not have worked, they're about to do that same thing because they're overconfident. They just got Aegis again, too, by the way, I believe. Yes, so they have Aegis, Cheese, and I think they even had the third item. Maybe someone already used it. Maybe I missed it somewhere. Um, but they're about to start doing the same stuff here, and it's not going to work this time. So look at this. All of them running up. What I think should happen in this lineup I think Pugna, with his Q and Aether Lens. Yeah, he's got the cooldown talent. He should just chip this tower away. Like, these two heroes do not need to commit in. And if anyone commits in, it should be the Bristleback, who stands up here to be the frontliner, so that um, Pugna can just keep blasting this tower. And then Jug waits in the back for something to happen. If you really wanted, I suppose Juggernaut could be up here hitting the tower because he has Aegis and like he's the he's a very strong carry who can get away from us. But I actually don't think he wants to. Not against um, Beastmaster who can pierce um, the spin, which usually makes him safe. Even if you have a Lotus Orb to protect him, like I just don't think it's worth it. I think Bristle should be up here frontlining, and he he just keeps blasting this tower, and we can't like that is the chip damage advantage um, that they should have. And they can just keep that up as long as they want because eventually our mid and top lanes will push into us because 
because they have the, the the racks, they have like stronger creeps. And so they just keep this up, force us to be here. Eventually the creeps make it to our wave, someone has to go rotate. And then they apply like particularly heavy pressure at that time while like one or two heroes is off over there. And you just repeat that, you just keep doing it. But instead like they're all running up. So let's keep going. They're all running up here. They don't even have their creeps yet. So like the blast and the damage aren't doing anything yet. They're going in like this. We'll slow it down a little bit. Let's take a look at positioning. Slark is in the back, going on the position five. Bat Rider, maybe? They don't have their full team here yet, but two of them are starting to go really deep while all of us are here. Bat Rider getting dealt with by Slark. Beastmaster disabling this guy, so he can't do anything because Pugno is really annoying for our lineup. Egg is probably... It's, it's okay. It could be a little further up, but like honestly, it's still going to hit a lot of these guys. Do you see how close they got grouped up against an Ember Spirit? Like That's why it shouldn't work. Ember Spirit is so good against heroes that all clump together because he can just slide a fist all of them and poke them down. And then he can keep healing in Fountain and then continue the poke while the enemy is like up here and they are not going to get to heal easily. Um, but he wasn't playing with us and that's why they were able to just all group up and take top and mid. But now we're all on the same page more or less, still angry at each other. And they tried the same thing, where they're all grouped up, they don't even have all their team, and we're killing them for it. We are... I My positioning is not the best. I'm, like, a little too far up, I feel. But overall, their team is just, like, they went too far in, trying to do the same stuff as before. Now I'm gonna die, but now Jug's up here. He's gonna get away, I think, because we don't have anything to cancel. That's pretty unlucky. This guy has a... Oh, I thought he had a basher. I guess not. Uh, that's weird. I swear he had a basher. I'm crazy, I guess. Um, but we win this game, actually. Isn't that crazy? I had to pull my team together. What happened? I'll show it. I'll show us now taking their high ground. You can disregard high ground rules when you just kill the enemy team. And we fast forwarded a bit, but they didn't have buybacks and we picked them off. And so now we can just like end the game straight up. Um, this guy diving real hard, but it's going to be fine. We're going to go bottom, I think. Let's see, what are we doing? Because we know they don't have buybacks, like this is the other way you break high ground, is you like slowly bait out buybacks, and when you know they can't buy back anymore, like you can now commit really heavily like this, which usually wouldn't work because usually you would get a kill, but then they buy back, and you're like way in their base, and that's too dangerous. But because they've used buybacks, um, now you can commit that hard. And, like, we're going straight through back door because we're strong enough to do so. And, like, they only have a bristle. What can he do? I don't think we should even waste time on him, but I guess it's okay. But, like, we just force through this. We don't even have creeps, but it doesn't matter. We have a Beastmaster, a Slark who has so many stacks. I have Liquid Fire. This is kind of wasting time, but at the same time, it's, like, okay. Sometimes that can be a loss. Um wasting time like this instead of focusing creeps and in fact that's how they lost this push they instead of instead of just going straight for the barracks or instead for the straight for the ancient they took the time to get top even though a lot of us were dead and so then they came to get mid after that because they thought we had just given up but then i fortified while macro firing and stuff and so our team decided to like okay fine we'll fight because they're all here and low and they want kills that's the trick even if your team has given up they want to get kills if it looks low and that's what got my team to come back in um, and because because it's a so late game, like we're able to just go through towers like this, and we actually came back. And all of this is on the back of them throwing it here. They didn't take high ground seriously. They thought they had won the game. Um, but let that be a lesson. Even when you have two racks up, even when the ancient is exposed, I hope you guys can't hear that. But there's some crazy drilling going on in front of me. Um, but you still have to respect high ground, and they didn't. They didn't at this point, even though they were so far ahead at that point, uh, and they lost the game. Don't lose the game like that, guys. Respect high ground. Take it seriously. Okay, we have to stop. This is the end of the video because this drilling is getting crazy. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but it is, it is getting to me. See you guys next time. Last video. Look forward to it.